All right, very good morning. It is Wednesday, 19th of June. Hope you are well. I'm joined here by, as you can see, uh, the kind of chain effect, two special guests, two men that caused a large degree of market movement yesterday. Uh, Donald Trump, uh, and Donald Trump pointing the finger, of course, at Mario Draghi, tweeting that Mario D unfairly propping up uh, the German DAX uh, and weakening, manipulating their currency. Um, but yeah, what we had yesterday was obviously a, a really interesting day. Lots of large movement derived on the back of a surprisingly, to start with, hawk, oh, excuse me, dovish uh, Mario Draghi, where he came out and effectively said, in terms of ECB policy, they've got the options available to them, such as cutting rates restarting quantitative easing, changing their language. You know, there was lots that came out that caught many by surprise and obviously created quite a meaningful move in European assets, that being a lower euro, supporting of not just European but global equities, you know, the, the eurozone area being so pivotal and does that set the stall out now for the Fed to follow suit uh, and move in sympathy with making you know, equally dovish noises? We'll find out later on tonight. But that was then followed by, of course, um, the U.S. president kind of playing his usual flip-flop on the, the China, the way he feels about them at this particular point in time. And obviously equities have had a bit of, bit of a rough time of it of late. So help propping it up and giving it a second injection, if you like, to the upside yesterday and also helping at least short term. Uh, mitigate any growing demand concerns for commodities because we saw a very strong move as well in WTI crude oil. Um, talks with China seemingly progressing again uh, ahead of the G20 where there was some uh, speculation around whether or not the two would even meet given the recent fallout over Huawei and the technology names and what's been happening with Mexico. But the point being is that um, both sides have confirmed that they've had a telephone call. It was positive. They're going to look to have a, an extended and at-length discussion at the G20 coming up at the end of the month. And in fact, they're even going to go as far as having uh, preparation kind of discussions ahead of that as well. So, yeah, firm close yesterday. Uh, quite positive moves, of course. Now, one thing that has come out um, since that point, this is a uh, Reuters exclusive and I believe the comments that came out, just given the tone of this article from Reuters, I would imagine it was indeed Bloomberg that broke the source story or the initial comments in regards to um, Mario Draghi. And so Reuters have come out and they've taken a slightly different perspective. They've basically contacted their sources and the sources are, uh, are saying that, OK, we've had some of these discussions about the options of easing in various different forms. But we're nowhere near any type of consensus. And actually, we've been caught a little bit blindsided by the fact that the president, Mario Draghi, has even started talking about this yet. So I guess this is a little bit of, this isn't the sources criticizing or talking out against Mario Draghi. This is definitely much more a case of the ECB looking to just realign things a little bit. Uh, it's kind of normal mechanisms of how they communicate. Uh, so that all options are left on the table and, and the market doesn't run away with itself, that the ECB are in all-out assault dovish mode. Uh, but yeah, quite interesting. They've, they've reined it in a touch, you would say, by the what this Reuters article has been suggesting. So Euro's kind of steadied out. If I flip over momentarily to the charts, you can see Euro top left. It's kind of flattened out. It's consolidated, if anything, holding on to a large portion of the loss from yesterday. Uh, equity markets, you can see the DAX, uh, equal kind of price movement after the aggressive rally yesterday. We're kind of, again, being in a, a sideways range, similar case for the US indices as we kind of await the next queue. And that ultimately is not going to come until this evening when we get the, the FMC announcement. So oil, the same. Buns, the same as well. Uh, if anything, where we left off from the European close yesterday, we've kind of remained at around similar levels. A few other things then to, to have a look at. Um, this, of course, was Donald Trump's um, tweet that moved the market yesterday. This was that um, conversation where the extended meeting next week at the G20 in Japan, respective teams will begin talking prior to the meeting. What was very interesting, actually, was that even though he made this quite conciliatory tone in his tweet, 
He actually had a campaign rally where he formally announced his running for the 2020 presidential race. And in, I think it was Orlando, Florida, he then started criticizing China again. So it's, it's just quite such an amazing era that we're in. He kind of, equity's looking a little fragile. He gives it the Trump bump, up it goes. And then he gets in front of the Joe public in America. I hate China. China are taking advantage of us. And so there very much is a, uh, a Donald Trump who communicates in order to appease and influence financial markets. And then there's the Donald Trump that communicates to the public in America to try and, um, you know, kind of cajole sentiment around his, you know, his policies and his agenda and so on. Uh, but markets haven't reacted to that, what he said last night on Orlando. We know that effectively when push comes to shove, more likely or not, he's going to want to manage this situation. All about timing, of course. Um, and as we're going to discuss, it's this idea about generally market consensus of the belief that Trump, it's a necessity for him to manage this in an appropriate way so that equities don't collapse and the economy doesn't suffer that has led to many big Wall Street banks, Goldman Sachs being probably the most notable name, all thinking that the Fed will not cut rates this year, despite the market pricing, because of the management of these types of big top level risks. But we'll get to that in a second. Talking about the Fed, of course, uh, this really is the main event of this week, you know, this month, uh, kind of trade talks aside, this really is uh, the major influencing factor for markets. So. Uh, definitely there's plenty more to come for the rest of this week for sure on the coattails of whatever we hear tonight so just to stress i'm going to be covering this live on our youtube channel uh, coverage will commence at 6 30 p.m so if you subscribe to the channel turn on your notifications you'll get an alert push on your phone and also an email as soon as that session goes live it's going to have a chat facility so me and the team i'll be covering i'll be giving you a full briefing I'll analyze it in real time as it happens, post analysis, both myself and then technically from Sam. Uh, and it's gonna be an ability to chat to the team as well as it's all happening. So hopefully you can join us. You can do it on the move on your mobile as well as your desktop. So hopefully that, that suits everyone. Um, but I'm gonna go into that, uh, the kind of Fed preview in much greater detail later on this evening. What I'm gonna do here is give you a brief overview of some of the key points that we're looking at. So really it is um, kind of decision time. Markets, we know, we've discussed this many times, are priced quite aggressively for interest rate cuts. Not so much an interest rate cut in this particular meeting. Uh, federal funds rate futures are priced at about 20% for this meeting. So possibility, but low. Uh, but very much so priced for a 25 basis point cut in the next meeting, which is at the end of July, and then possibly subsequent cuts thereafter. Um, so what are we looking out for uh, within this? So there's a couple of graphics here. One is uh, the kind of statement. Now the statement could be particularly important because the types of words used around the descriptive nature of what Federal Reserve uh, members are describing for the US economy could be very telling for the future course of action. So you know, let's stick with the base case here. They don't cut rates, but the question is then, what happens next? And so, a couple things. One, downside risks. You can see here, the, you know, the economy has, as far as economists' views to the risks to growth and inflation, has soured since the last time that we got the summary of economic projections. As you can see here, the black bar has got increasingly larger over time. And we've kind of had a distinct shift from where we were in September before the kind of real Q4 route that we had in markets to where we are today. So with that being said then, we are expecting some downward revisions in the lights of growth going forward. Inflation, that's been one of the main reasons why kind of tepid inflation of why uh, people have been pricing in these cuts. Now, interestingly though, this is a, a, what I saw on Bloomberg this morning, a traffic light policy conditions. I can't say I've seen one of these before, but I kind of like what it's suggesting. And what it's looking at here are a couple of different indicators, you know, possibly that the Fed will look at in terms of market pricing. But it gives you an idea of where they're at, where the economy is at. 
uh, and why or not there is a need to take action. So let me just quickly explain. Going from left to right is time. So if you go all the way back, this is when interest rates in the US were sat at 0.75%. And this was then when interest rates, the, the red ones are when interest rates have changed and in this case gone, gone up. So here you can see as we've raised interest rates, the S&P has been you know, really strong. Now, how these color codes work is the more red it is, the more indicative it is that the Fed should be tightening policy. The more green it is, the more the Fed should be loosening policies or cutting. So here you can see inflation was the only thing that was relatively soft at the point of which they were raising rates. Still, though, given the strength of the stock market, and given some of the other areas like the unemployment rate that was dropping at the time, the financial conditions index was picking up, warranting uh, that they were showing the economy was improving and heating up. So rate hike, rate hike, rate hike. We take us all the way to where we are at the moment. Now, you can see here the stock market is quite a notab noticeable difference. Um, every time, and what has been a very clear pattern, there's been this pretty one-dimensional and consistent stock market increase. We had the wobble at the end of last year and the beginning of the year, but then a really significant turnaround. And we're pretty flat at the moment. The other thing is, here the unemployment rate remains particularly low. And one thing is, if you actually look at the stock market as of now, just given the, you know, the rally we had yesterday and as I said, the belief if this China trade war gets managed correctly, well then that would all suggest then why the need to be so aggressive in the action you're taking now. A lot of the commentators have said that why would you cut right now in this meeting? Some people believe that might be the case, but the risk here is that if they were to cut now, that would be very preemptive action and the question marks, even though you might get an initial quite positive response in markets that the Fed are being proactive, I think in the medium term, once the dust settles, the market will start asking the questions. Why have the Fed felt that they've needed to take such drastic immediate action? What is wrong? Why are they seeing this? And I think that in itself would instigate a degree of more uncertainty and more panic. And I think that would backfire as a strategy. Uh, in terms of how the Federal Reserve will want to manage this and hence the reason why I believe they won't cut tonight but they will be signalling a July cut. So yeah, looking at here it's the inflation figures and obviously the inversion of yield spreads or pushing towards that they're looking at the twos tens here that would all be things that would say that not only is uh, inflation conditions low and low unemployment isn't really influencing that in its traditional sense, but these indicators that have been good precursors of impending recession have also been kind of flashing uh, that you know, the course of action is probably going to be prudent to loosen policy. The thing then that this will come down to um, in terms of the initial headlines that we're looking out for could well be just the numbers associated with the, with the dot plots. Obviously, with, this is the March dot plot. Now this looks significantly out of date because of how things have changed. The purple and white lines here are basically overnight index swaps in the Fed Funds futures and as you can see they're much more dovishly priced i.e. interest rates could be a touch lower at the end of this year and then dropping thereafter at the end of 2020 and 2021. The big question mark here about how hawkish or dovish the market will react is about if this is the current market pricing and this is where we are in the Fed dot plots, how far does the Fed come towards where the market is? There is a distinct risk, I feel, that the markets have got too carried away with this dovish pricing and what's going to happen is the Fed do become more dovish but not just quite as much as the market were looking for and as a net result, it's not that they're hawkish but you get a kind of hawkish reaction if that makes sense. But again, we'll go into this in much more detail in specific assets and how they'll react later on this evening. This is those major banks. Uh, I just wanted to give you a bit of a flavor. You can see here Citi, Goldman's, MS, UBS, they're all expecting no rate changes uh, at this point for the rest of this year. Quite on the contrary though, Barclays is the most aggressive. Barclays are looking for multiple rate cuts and they're looking for the big one. They're looking for them in July. Barclays believes the Fed are going to pull out you know, the 50 basis point cut 
and then follow it up with another 25. Um, Bank of America, JP, Deutsche um, looking for more graduated type moves, but Deutsche and Barclays looking for an end game with a much lower value by the end of the year, looking for three rate cuts. Uh, Bank of America, JP2, the rest on the top line, none. Okay, well that's it on the, the Fed side. One thing I would say is a word of caution for any of the new traders, you probably will see relatively, barring anything unexpected, quite quiet markets this morning. Uh, that will be largely in anticipation for what has become now a very important event for financial markets. Two months ago, this was seen as a bit of a non-event. The world has changed quite rapidly. Market expectations have changed then accordingly. Uh, and now it's up to the Fed. Do they meet those, you know, those kind of lofty dovish expectations or not? Elsewhere, let's have a look at something else. Um, we had, of course, the second ballot of the Conservative MP race for who's going to replace Theresa May. And you saw Boris Johnson has even improved further. I think it calculates out at about 40% of the vote that he's capturing at the moment. Dominic Rabb, the most hard Brexit, got the chop, so he's gone. Sajid Javid just barely made the cut. Rory Stewart's had the one with the greatest momentum going from 19 in the first round to 37, but he still resides back in fourth place. Now, we did have the televised debate, of course, last night. Um, let me just give you a flavor of that. I'm not sure if anyone watched the BBC debate last night, but it's embarrassing. It's, it's all I can say. It's uh, I don't know. I don't want to get too political and, and, and start giving my my personal views, but yeah, I'll leave it at that. But the one thing I think that was quite clearly evident: there was no real standout performance, and importantly. Boris Johnson, who appeared really for the first time facing questions in a live environment and against his competition, didn't put largely a foot wrong. He didn't make a big mistake. Uh, and I guess that's just a crisis averted as far as Boris Johnson goes. Um, so all things remaining equal. I think Rory Stewart didn't put in such a kind of surprising performance of strength that he did before. I thought Sajid Javid did a better job this time of asserting himself a little bit better. I thought Hunt and Gove uh, were pretty much repeat performances of the first time round and Boris Johnson um, didn't make any mistakes, not that he was particularly strong. So all things remaining equal. I would say if there's going to be a cut here, uh, I still think that as much as it seems like the, the social media space has really rallied behind Rory, I really do think that he's going to get the, the cup sooner or later, as to will Sajid Javid. I really think it goes then down to Johnson, Hunt and Gove in the end. Uh, and then I think it's going to be Hunt and Johnson still is my, my kind of base case view, because the necessary puppet masters behind the scenes will make sure that it's not a Gove-Johnson which I think Gove is generally a little bit more pressing as a character and a little bit more aggressive in his debating skill. And that will be something the Johnson camp will want to be severely avoiding because if you poke Johnson enough, I'm sure he'll come out with something that he shouldn't say. So I think it will be a Hunt-Johnson story. The process we know now is that basically there's going to be another ballot that's going to happen and then another ballot the day after, all the way until we hopefully by the end of the week should get down to the point of where we have the final two candidates. That then takes another couple of weeks and the end of July we have our leader. So again, as per the case of what we saw yesterday, the pound's not reacting to any of this. I mean, if there were a risk event, it was that, as well as describing this time yesterday, that, that Boris was going to make an almighty mistake but, and that just didn't happen. Uh, he's kind of reined it in and, and, and tried to stay rather quiet. Uh, it's probably the best tactic if he wants to keep his hopes alive. Other things, final headlines, then I'll hand you over to Sam. Um, oil markets you know, definitely had a, a decent move to the upside yesterday. Some good technical breaches of levels on the upside. Nice momentum behind some of the movement when it was breaking those points. In addition to the fact that monetary policy stimulus helping mitigate global growth concerns, this kind of whatever it takes mentality, coupled with, of course, Donald Trump easing trade war tensions in the short term. So oil moved higher. Now, 
obviously we continue to monitor the situation uh, in the Gulf, particularly between Saudi and Iran. We heard yesterday that you know new U.S. troops are going to be deployed to the tune of 1,500 to keep peace in the region. The latest thing that's happened that's being reported from overnight, a rocket hit an area of Basra, Iraq's oil and gas hub that houses several global oil companies earlier this morning, uh, coming amid rising tensions between the US and Iran. So, you know, just more potential destabilization in, the, in that area is something to be aware of, that's all. I mean, this headline itself not having a, uh, a one and done kind of reaction in markets, but you know, things are definitely simmering away uh, and obviously having just more US military presence in the region should should create more uh, stability. But obviously, if you're from the other side of the table, you could be seeing this as a hostile move and activity and therefore it could ignite things even further. So definitely a fluid situation that needs monitoring very closely if you're an oil trader. OK, quick look at the calendar. What have we got coming out? Because before the main event, the FMC, there certainly is a few other things that are going on. So we just have a look. You've got UK CPI. Um, that's going to be at 9.30. Now, we are expecting year-on-year -year CPI to fall slightly 2% back from 2.1, a range of 2.2 at the high to 1.8 at the low. Um, this is just a quick graphic of year-on-year uh, -year CPI in the UK. And you know this is why... When we hear from the various central banks this week, we've got the Fed, we've heard from Draghi, we've got the Bank of Japan, uh, we've also got the Bank of England, of course, tomorrow. And it's actually the Bank of England that are probably going to sound the least dovish. And one of the main reasons is, is that if you're Xing out the impact and uncertainty surrounding Brexit, which obviously is the main focus, then actually the unemployment rate, uh, the job situation, the wage situation, as a consequence, the inflation situation, these would all be on the balance, more hawkish indicators for policy. So yeah, definitely gonna be a lot more even-handed rather than being dovish like we're likely to hear from some of those other uh, central banks of late. But overall, from a market reaction point of view, if you're trading sterling, I wouldn't be looking for too great a movement on the back of the CPI, traditionally a, a tier one release, but as for the aforementioned macro, risks predominantly focused on brexit it's hard to really put too much weight on these economic indicators um, if anything i would say you've got to be looking at numbers pressing down at really 1.6 on the lower bound or 2.4 on the upper bound for it really to be something of more magnitude where you might get a bit more of a decent run in the currency i would say back to the the calendar other than that other than inflation indicators out of the uk at 9:30. Uh, it's pretty quiet for the European morning. We then get into the US session. Again, equally pretty quiet. We get the DOE oil infantry numbers. So while Sam is on the mic doing the technicals, I'll populate the chat with the API numbers from last night. Uh, but I believe it was a drawdown, if I remember what I saw last night before I went to bed. Um, and then you've got some Canadian numbers as well for the currencies. Speaker-wise, the ECB forum in central Portugal continues. I believe this is the final day. So again, I'll post the schedule of when any major speakers are going to be talking. I'll pop that in the chat room as well after this briefing. Uh, otherwise, uh, it looks like on the calendar, the closing remarks are going to be given by Mario Draghi at 3 p.m. So I would be mindful of uh, that event. ECB's COA also speaking and Mountain Schlager throughout the day as well from that same meeting. Um, the ballot vote, if it's going off the same process uh, for the elimination round of the Conservative race, that would be at 6 p.m. And again, I wouldn't really see that as a market moving event, to be quite honest. So I'll just update you again tomorrow morning in the briefing. All right, that is it. Let me hand you over to Sam. He can talk you through a couple of the charts. And as I said, I'll pop a few, few things in the Trading Live chat room in the meantime. OK, thank you very much, guys. Hi right, guys, hope everyone has uh, had a, a good uh, good morning so far. I'll have a quick look over uh, the charts of how we're trading and some, some levels to, to be aware of after yesterday was a pretty good day opportunity wise, uh, certainly into the afternoon uh, as we saw uh, the stocks really push on. So just having a, a quick look at, at today, I wouldn't get too excited uh, trading stocks uh, in really up until the build up for the FOMC likely to be pretty range-bound trade. 
uh, wouldn't be too aggressive looking to get in really unless we maybe came back down to the pivot to be honest which is obviously quite a key point as you can see here uh, other than uh, being the pivot it was previous high from yesterday and of course the previous high that we had back on the 11th uh, of, of June so unless we were to really come back to that I wouldn't be too interested in, in getting in and um, historically when we have had a, a day like that where we're up you know I think whatever percentage it was only uh, the day before a uh, FOMC meeting uh, only two of the ten times that happened did the next day finish positive so you know, read what you want into that but likelihood is we're just drift sideways really uh, in, in stocks and I think there'll be you know better opportunities later on uh, if at all I just you know while sentiment right now favours the upside following yesterday whether you'd want to get too aggressive or not and, you know before the Fed I'm not too not too sure a couple of uh, interesting markets on the, the longer term you can see just how great the support level here was on the Aussie if I just bring this into picture the the low of the, the year, the flash crash low, pretty much to uh, the tick, the bounce off that. Uh, if you remember Australian dollar going back, well, a few, well, a couple of years, 2017, 2018, pretty much the same uh, as a double top there. Uh, really strong uh, resistance turned here now to the lows, looking to the lows, sorry, a uh, decent level of support. Uh, really, you're going to want it to get above 69.19, certainly on the daily chart for for this to be a, a sustained recovery, uh, but a decent hold here uh, off that that first test of uh, of those lows and a really you know nice um, nice move higher following that and, and helped I guess by uh, just a bit of profit taking as well. Just having a look more intraday, uh, obviously looking and, and favouring that 69.19, also the the previous low from the 13th. You could argue the high of the the 14th morning as well. That's certainly a, a point that I would would keep marked up. Uh, to the downside, any potential targets should we we break that low, uh, we'd probably be, well, I guess targeting. Let's have a quick look, trend line wise. Yeah, I, I reckon not a bad way here. You can see you've got your your free tests of this around to, towards the S1, and this trend line could certainly be uh, something to to focus on there for for the Aussie. Uh, but the key level remains near that R1. That's certainly where I'd be be looking at. Having a look at the the yen as well, pretty range pound overall, despite having a really strong push in the morning yesterday, and then uh, as the equity markets uh, soared higher, we did come lower. Uh, but those lows have held firm. You can see here uh, the S1 and yesterday's low was uh, certainly talked about a, a good level for a range trade uh, in the morning. Whether it could have got there or not was. Uh, anyone's guess. It did, however, held firm and also the high of the day, marking the, the top end of that range. And maybe for the better opportunity here, it's just going to be waiting for uh, either of those to come into play or to break. Midpoint here, pretty much you could argue the pivot previous resistance from, from yesterday evening, uh, you can see just below as well. So you're lying in the sand for maybe a move higher or lower. This sort of zone here, uh, where you had the previous high of today, the high of yesterday evening, uh, and the pivot as well acting as a, a bit of support potentially now the pound obviously got the data to coming uh, coming out the the high of the, the day pretty much the low that we had back on Monday morning uh, as well so I'd still be keeping a, a close eye on that should we get through and certainly there's some good opportunities technically anyway for for the short a bit higher up you've got the the breakdown area here on the futures 126.39 and of course the R1 R2 sorry and the high that we had uh, from uh, well from the week so far your line in the sand if you just have to have that drawn up probably 125.88 just a bit below the pivot uh, could be somewhere to keep an eye on you can see how we found support uh, from what was previously a resistance level around that 87 88 89 uh, so if we were to get a break below there uh, then we can start looking at uh, pressing towards yesterday's uh, lows euro which obviously we can Following Draghi's comments has been pretty range bound since. Uh, I, not that I necessarily think we can get up to R1 without a reason behind it, but if we were to have a slow, gradual grind and before the Fed, it technically looks quite a nice uh, place to get in. Uh, but for now, range bound, uh, we're obviously keeping an eye on that, that double bottom from yesterday. If that was to, to break a quick run down to the S1, is always 
uh, you know, one to, to keep a, a, you know, uh, an eye on. Also, just making this onto a 15 minute chart, you can see the trend lines uh, here well respected from yesterday evening to, to this morning uh, and then to just, well, about 39 minutes ago uh, on the hour, the top of the hour there. Uh, for euro so above that you could get a bit of relief back towards the pivot where we saw decent enough price action yesterday a bit wicky uh, but along with that pivot you could offer some resistance going forward gold as well which uh, did the similar move to the yen uh, but what an opportunity it was for anyone that, that fancied the pivot or around that yesterday to get long uh, that has obviously pushed through uh, as well if we were to have a, a strong push higher at any point today and of course ahead of the fed will be on the the mic going through these levels but you can see this trend line perhaps, perhaps matching up near that r2 uh, as well as a, a sort of a an extremity for this move to the downside uh, really uh, the it's pretty range bound on, on that low if we were to get below that uh, another good opportunity for that range bound long around S1 yesterday's low still remains to be uh, a half decent trade. Just having a quick look at the 17th low on that trend line here you go you can see we just found this trend line here that obviously have only just come into play you've got your third test of this, this is quite interesting you've got the low here Monday Tuesday afternoon and then just now as well along with that low of the day so one to keep an eye on if we do find support and push higher uh, if we were to break this trend line, you can imagine there being a, a faster money move targeting really down towards the S1. The pivot higher the day, uh, uh, containing price for now to the upside. Let's have a quick look over European equities following uh, you know, a decent push of the here of the open. Pretty range man. That summarises what is most likely to be the case in the build-up uh, to the central bank meetings uh, today. Uh, as well, have a quick look at oil uh, following the... Uh, the draw yesterday, not as, as big as expected, but still uh, a drawdown for the, the, the headline number there. Uh, we are stuck within a bit of a range as well. Uh, failure to push higher, uh, be keeping keeping tabs really 54.08 uh, to the downside, maybe even calling it 54 and then 54.50, 54, 50, 54 uh, to the upside. Uh, unless we were to get a break out of that, not too interested in getting involved uh, in this market ahead of the DOEs. Uh, for later any questions as usual please uh, do let us know obviously 840 so in just going back you've got 50 minutes now until the UK numbers as and and as and mentioned not expecting too much in the way of uh, significant movement from that just considering everything that's going on and even with the, the Bank of England tomorrow as well I hope you all have a, a great uh, trading date and I'll catch you all in the chat